In this conversation, we're going to be talking about the humility of God. Mm -hmm. God is great. He's massive in power. He's omnipotent, omniscient, mm -hmm. omnipresent, and yet God is humble. Mm. He's condescending. He comes down. Mm. What we've been discovering from Scripture is this incredible idea of God's covenant faithfulness. Mm. And now we've come to the incarnation of the cross, and we're going to, we're going to discover in Scripture that, that God coming down in humility to become a member of the human race and then going to the cross on our behalf is the consummate demonstration of His covenant faithfulness. Amen. That's where we need to go. When you say there that God is big and He's powerful and He's all-knowing and yet He's humble, it reminds me of, of something that I've said to people in the past, that God is the only being in the entire universe who has a native right to be proud. Mm. And yet he's not. And yet he's not. Because everybody else, you know, Paul says in the New Testament, wh why, what causes you to differ from someone else? Why would you be, it's not wise mm. to compare yourselves among yourselves because mm. all of us are dependent on something or someone and all ultimately dependent upon God for everything we have, the great things, our, mm. our mind, our money, or whatever the things that we think we could be proud about. Some people are proud about their skin color. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. But, but everything that we have is because of something else, and yet we're proud about it. Mm -hmm. But God is the one being in the universe who doesn't mm -hmm. get His attributes from any other source. So mm -hmm. He is the one being that could be natively proud, mm -hmm. and yet He's the humblest being in the universe. Oh, it's astounding. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 would be a good text to begin that's with. The, I think that's great. We need to... We need to realize basically two things here from this text that I think are just powerful. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 or 1 First Timothy 3.16? 1 Timothy, First Timothy 3.16. 16. All right, 1 Timothy 3.16. This is talking about the incarnation. And it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, or received up in glory. Astounding. James, you've got the NIV there. Mm -hmm. well, how does it, what is it for the phrase there for without controversy, verse 16? NIV says in 1 Timothy 3, 16, beyond all question. Yeah, okay. It's beyond a mystery. That's his point. He's basically mm -hmm. saying there's no doubt about it. That's yes. how we'd say it in modern mm -hmm. vernacular. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Can't question it, can't argue about it. It's a mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. And the first thing that he, because God in himself is a mystery. We don't mm -hmm. understand fully, and we've spent time on that, what it mm -hmm. means For to, God to be God, God yeah. in his nature. Mm -hmm. But the first thing that comes to Paul's mind when he says, without a doubt, great is the mystery of godliness, is this phrase here, God was manifested in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would go out on a limb and hazard, I don't know for sure, but that word there is, is probably carne or some derivative of carne, mm -hmm. which is... Flesh. The flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that right there is what we mean when we say incarnation. The incarnation is God in his godness somehow mm -hmm. condescending and choosing to become a man. There's a nuance here. Great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of what God is like. God condescended to become human. That's not what we're expecting from God. Mm. We're not expecting in our general perceptions of what it would mean to be God, we perceive God as powerful and elevated. And yet here, Paul seems to be saying, there's something about God that takes our breath away. There's something about God that is just a great mystery. He came down. That's right. Going God back. became human. Yeah, in fact, in the NIV, it goes on to describe just what you're saying, Ty. It says, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. What version is that? NIV. NIV. Oh, that's the mystery from, from which, which true, true godliness, godliness springs, springs is great. It, God was manifest in the flesh. This, He's modeling for yes. us what greatness looks like. Yes. Humility. It's condescension. It's hum yes. Greatness is greatness of character, not greatness of position. And that's mm -hmm. the opposite of what we read about during the fall of Lucifer. That's where I was just at. You got the it. fall yeah. of Lucifer yeah. is, the, is the exact yeah. opposite. It's an inversion of reality yeah, as I God think, created reality to mm -hmm. operate. I think you dropped Philippians 2, or somebody did, mm -hmm. and showed the progression of right. yes. that yeah. in it Philippians 2, yeah. Christ is condescending, mm -hmm. condescending, condescending, mm -hmm. and then you, you parallel that to the Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah, Isaiah, 14, yeah, Isaiah 14. And yeah. Isaiah 14 where 
where, where Lucifer is seeking to exalt his Just own as himself. a reminder, what happened in comparing those two, two scriptures, for those who are sitting in on the discussion with us and the conversation with us, Isaiah 14 is, I will exalt myself going up, up, I will ascend, I will sit on the mount of the congregation, on the sides of the north, the farthest sides of the north, up, 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 and then the poem concludes, yet you'll be brought down to the sides of the pit. The lowest, the lowest depths, depths of, of the pit. pit. And then Philippians 2, by comparison, by contrast, mm -hmm. is the one who was equal with God, condescended, became nothing, down, 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 therefore he's exalted. And he's exalted, and every yeah. knee bows down. Do you remember the, the distinction we also made that in, in the text, it says that he will be like the most high, mm -hmm. yeah. which is God. And then we ask, wait a second, we've been describing how God is love, God is love, God is love. Mm -hmm. Did this self-serving creature, Lucifer, want to be love? No. Mm -mm. no. And then we, we talked about that, how he wanted the he power, God's of power God. without God's character. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very he profound He wanted the there. position. Well, and you can be sure, we can be sure, that of the things that Satan wanted, one of them was certainly not to become a human being, to become mm -hmm. flesh. God here, it says, great is the mystery of godliness, that God would condescend, that he would divest, and I think we should talk about that mm -hmm. word when we get to Philippians 2, that he would divest himself. Satan's not into divestment, mm -hmm. he's into investment. Mm -hmm. I want more, I want to be greater, I want to be grander, mm -hmm. where God's like, oh, do I need to go down? Do I need, oh, I need to go lower, yeah. okay, I'll go. Basically, Satan's kingdom and character is me, 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 and God's kingdom and character is you, you, mm -hmm. you, you, you. That's right. That's the bottom line. Can I introduce a verse here in, in Hebrews chapter 2? I've always, ever since the first time I read this, it's always just amazed me because in Hebrews 2, it talks about the condescension. We're talking about the incarnation, carne, God becoming flesh. But in Hebrews 2, in verse 9, and Ty, I know th these are favorites of yours as well. It says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And I always picture this, this idea where it says that God condescends lower than the angels. In other mm. words, there's three... To my knowledge, there's three sort of categories of beings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least in Scripture. I know there's other worlds and so sure. forth, but there's God, then there's the angelic order, and then there's humanity. Mm -hmm. Those are the three primary mm -hmm. orders in Scripture. And God skips through order number two, mm -hmm. and he stoops down to order number one, meaning that humanity is now more closely linked with God mm. yeah. than even angels would yeah. be. Yeah. Because we now, share, we now share the flesh, we share humanity with God in a way, in an intimacy, in a degree of intimacy that angels would never be able to comprehend. Yeah, yeah, it's astounding. Yeah. The, the, the idea Beautiful. here is that humanity has been incorporated in to the Godhead, not being elevated to divinity in nature, but being elevated by the condescension and humanity of Christ to become one with the triune Godhead in fellowship, in the closest possible intimacy. How old are the angels? Like, how long have the angels been around? I've always tried, tried to think about that. I think it's been about... <laughs> Nobody I was like, seriously, I, I was like, <laughs> really? I'm like, whoa. Well, they predate human beings, according to Job 38. We can, we can say they've been around for hundreds of years. What? Thousands. Can we say hundreds? they've been... <coughs> hundreds? Come on. I'm, I'm testing. Okay, okay, Thousands? Okay. Sure, yes. Millions? Uh, Who knows? Perhaps. Here, here's my point. Here's my point. I've been Good, around... make it, because I've been around for 30 you. years. Some of you guys are, are much older. Serious. Some of you guys are about Serious. 100 years old. But I've been You're around for, good for, 30. for 30 years. And here's the thing. Is it possible that in my 30 years of existence, because God has become part of this race, I can enjoy an interaction and an intimacy with God that even angels that have been around for hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of years would not be able to enter into that type of experience. 30 years compared to millions of years, the difference is that Jesus became part of my race. Mm, yeah. He's your elder brother. He's my elder brother. And you, it's actually in Hebrews too, right? With the perfect brother. theological accuracy, we can say that a full-fledged member of the human race right now, this very moment, is seated on the throne of the universe at the right hand of God. That's right. A human being is there right now. The significance of this, I think, is really brought out in, in Philippians chapter 2. Awesome. 
I'm going to read the NIV because I haven't read this, I don't know ever, but in a long time for sure. What, you're in Hebrews 2 still? He, no, Philippians chapter 2. You've okay. never I, read Philippians 2? I've read it many times, but I don't know if I've ever read it in the NIV. Oh, oh okay. okay. And the NIV is really unique, I think, to me, and anyway, to my understanding, it's talking here in verse 5. Let's just start there. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So this is relational language. It, it's, it's, as we said in 1 Timothy 3.16, God is giving us an example of true godliness, what it means to be mm -hmm. godly. And then it goes on, it says, who, talking about Christ, being in very nature God, mm. did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. nothing. Yeah. He made himself nothing. You were talking about the, the three spheres. There's God, there's angels, there's man. And then there's fallen man, which is man still, but fallen man. That's a good point. <laughs> he didn't just come down to yeah. Adam's perfect, Edenic. And then, and then, of course, in the fallen realm, we have kings and queens and presidents, and we have, you know, I travel yeah. a lot. We have first class, and we have business class, and we have economy. <laughs> Yeah. And then we have the people who get a ticket at the in last coach, minute, coach. and they're That's in me, by the bathroom. By the bathroom, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it says here he made himself because when I think about Jesus, I think about the fact that he was born in a manger. A manger. That's a good point. He made a himself feeding trough. Nothing. He went to the very lowest of the low. Mm. And to me, I just I can't. I guess I can't relate to that because I want business class. I want upgrades. I want. Something. I want premier status. I want to go in the you short You have line. premier status, <laughs> don't you? On United, <laughs> right. anyway. He can, made I, can I nothing. build something into this? Are then? you done with Philippians 2? No, I mean, I'm oh, done with it, but I just wanted to. That was the point. I, you know, yeah. That was the point I brought us there. Because for. there was something even back in Hebrews. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go. Oh, yeah. you did? Okay. I want, to go, I want to go to Hebrews and Philippians 2, but mm. we, we rushed away from Hebrews before we were done there, so go for it. Well, just in Hebrews 2 9, I just wanted to bring this out. And I love where you went there, by the way, James, because that's a reminder that I need. I, mm -hmm. I'm like you. I want the upgrade. Mm -hmm. I want the adoration. Mm -hmm. I want the attention. Mm -hmm. I want to be... I, I, I. Mm -hmm. And without this mm -hmm. model of mm -hmm. who, what real... Godliness. What real... Um, the word is escaping me. What, what real beauty looks like mm -hmm. is not when you're at the top, mm -hmm. but when you're at the bottom serving. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I need that. Yeah. So, so in Hebrews 2, 9, I just love the word that. Mm. Um, to me, the whole verse hinges on That's the word. That's exactly what I was going to emphasize. So love well, it. Then I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're there. Let me no, defer I don't to want you. to defer. No, I, want to defer. Yeah, I don't want you to defer. Okay, then I won't defer. Yeah. I'll, I'm do just, I'm just guys, I'll do it if you guys. Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Jeffrey, unpack that. Now, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, yeah. that... He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For the purpose of. For the purpose That's of. That's right. God cannot die in his godness. In mm -hmm. fact, the Bible says, for example, in John 1, verse 4, in him was life. Mm. I mean, the very principle of, we talked about in the beginning, how God is creative, God is relational, God mm. creates. So God as God is not going to suffer a heart attack. He's not going to have a stroke. Mm -hmm. God is not going to die of old age. He was, he is, and he ever will be. Mm -hmm. So how is God ever going to experience entropy? How is He going to experience aging? How is He going to experience thirst and hunger and temptation and suffering and ultimately death? Mm. But now this is where James is going. Not just a first class death, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not even a business class death, mm -hmm. but the coach death, the mm -hmm. death of the cross. Mm -hmm. yeah. He has to become a man because mm -hmm. God as God is yeah. not subject to death. He becomes a man that yeah. mm -hmm. he can taste death. Mm -hmm. So, so we could say it this way, I think, that, that the incarnation was the necessary bridge that God traversed to get to the cross. He submitted himself by virtue of the incarnation mm -hmm. to a set of parameters and limitations that would render his sacrifice on the cross real, genuine, and authentic. Mm -hmm. As so, a real human. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so that's, that's the bridge. In Paul's theology, in biblical theology, the idea is that the incarnation and the death of Jesus on the cross are vitally linked. Mm -hmm. Of course. One occurs in order that. The other the might occur. Yeah, in order that the other might occur. It's an, it's an amazing bridge of understanding. So having made that point in, in Hebrews chapter 2, 
go back to Philippians and see mm -hmm. what you guys think of this. Where, and I, I really appreciate the fact that James read from the NIV there. The NIV misses the mark as, as all translations do on some points and then nails it on others. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the New King James Version, it says the one who being, verse six, being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That's pretty hard language to wrap your mind around. Mm. But the word that is here translated no reputation in the NIV is translated nothing. Mm. And, and it's, it's a Greek word, kenoo, and it means to empty. Mm -hmm. So that's a great translation. Mm -hmm. It means to, to empty the content mm -hmm. of, of, of something. This is amazing because the, the content that makes God the, the being that he is falls into two basic categories. There is the character of God that makes God who God is and the nature of God that makes God who God is. And then there are abilities and powers that, that go along with that status as God. The Phillips translation does something fascinating here. It renders, I love that yeah, it the renders the idea of kinoo or kenosis, no reputation or made himself nothing as he laid aside his divine privileges and prerogatives. Mm. Hmm. In other words, he's, he's choosing by the incarnation to put into a remission or an inactive state certain powers that are native to equality with God. Mm -hmm. And we put these in, in three basic categories, and they are what we sometimes refer to as the three great omnes. God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, and God is omnipresent. And these are the abilities, the powers, that according to the testimony of the gospel accounts, Jesus laid aside on our behalf in order for the cross to become an authentic experience. And there's evidence for this in scripture. It's, it seems so enormous mm. that it's unbelievable. We think, no, that can't, really? Did he come down that far? Did he lay aside omnipotence? Well, Jesus himself testified. Mm -hmm. He said in John 5, 30, mm. I can of mine own self do nothing. nothing. Mm -hmm. Same so, word there, nothing. I don't know if it's the same Greek word, but it's yeah. the same idea. So mm -hmm. if Jesus is, we're seeing him performing miracles and raising the dead, the question is, is he, is he exercising his own native omnipotence to heal the sick and raise the dead? Or is he utilizing and tapping into the omnipotence of the Father as a human being? Later on in the- That we the, have all access to. Yes, that, that we all have yeah. access to. Peter and Paul healed the sick and raised the dead. They're not, natively omnipotent. They, they were tapping into the omnipotence of the Father. Well, it's fascinating because in Acts chapter two, it says that Jesus did many signs and wonders, comma, which God did through him. Mm -hmm. so, right. so we're witnessing the Father's omnipotence on display through Jesus, the human being. Mm -hmm. So he laid aside his, his omnipotence. What about omniscience? The Bible says in Luke's account you break down of the what gospel, that even means, omniscience means to know everything, of course. Mm -hmm. Omniscience, uh, omnipotence, all power, mm -hmm. and omniscience to be all knowing, to know everything. And Luke's gospel says of Jesus that the child grew in knowledge as well as in stature, it says. Stature mm -hmm. meaning biologically, yeah, he yeah. grew up and he went through he grew the phases. intellectually okay. as well. But, but he grew intellectually. He grew. He grew in his knowledge. That means that he learned things. Things came to be known by him. Now that's not a description of omniscience. God never, never ever learns anything in his omniscience. He never has an aha moment. God never ever ever says, whoa, I never thought of that before. The fact is that Jesus is in a different state now. Mm -hmm. He's in a different state of being. He's laid aside these omnes. And it's an incredible humility and condescension. Maybe that's why he says in Matthew 24 and verse 36, but of the day and the hour knoweth no man, not, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So we're gonna take a quick break here. Ty, you've unpacked omnipotent and omniscient, but I want you to speak when we come back even to the issue of omnipresence. Okay. And uh, we're gonna talk just here in our break about um, a school that we all teach at, mm. uh, Arise Australia. 
is our new school, and then Arise Here in America has been running for just over a decade, and it's a great program. We've had hundreds of people, young and old alike, come and be trained at that, mm -hmm. and so we're going to see a little short on that. Amen. Mm. Arise uh, originally started from an acronym, and it was a resource institute for soul winning and evangelism. So we see ourselves not just as a Bible working, training evangelism ministry, but as something more rounded and more beautiful and more biblical, a discipleship ministry where that sharing, that ministry, that evangelism grows out of a rock solid, faith based relationship with Jesus Christ. Since I got here to Arise, I have been captivated since day one. The teaching and the instruction has been phenomenal. God has truly blessed us um, in giving us both practical and theoretical um, guidance that we may, as, as Bible workers, go out and do a good work for the Lord. The program is very practical because not only do you get the classroom instruction, but we deliberately designed the program in such a way that the students are out on the streets and in the homes. The reality is, is that every single year that our students go door to door, they encounter people that would otherwise never step foot in a church anywhere. There's 24 students here and 240 contacts have been made by knocking on doors. So the students are out knocking on doors, making contacts with people in the community to lead them to the mission where they'll hear the gospel preached by an evangelist. And so we have the freedom to choose how and when we worship, right? So there is no enforced Sunday observance yet. It's been a real privilege to be a part of the Crusades and to, to put into practice that which we are learning and to see what God is doing um, in our lives, put into practice and in the lives of those which we are reaching out to. It's been my joy to, to pray with people, to go visit with people, to see people from the doors that we've been knocking on getting baptised. We just reached the end of the 18 meetings that we've had here, the first Arise um, mission that's been run here in Australia. Um, the students have been involved in door knocking, Bible studies, reaching people at the mission, and it's been such a great success. God has been so good to me um, in giving me this opportunity to learn more about Him the one who I desire to be like, the one who I desire to serve all the days of my life. And whether he wants me to do a medical profession, whether he wants me to do anything, I know that I've been planted on a sure foundation and that's upon his word. So basically Arise is a discipleship training school. I'm just rejoicing uh, to be a part of it. and. Uh, the students are just such a blessing to interact with, and uh, the school now in Australia is giving us an opportunity to, to basically train young people or people of any age to understand the scriptures and to, to really become a vibrant, genuine witness for Christ in whatever their vocation happens That's to right. be that they're pursuing in life. So mm -hmm. James Praise just God. got back from, from the graduation. In Arise Australia. In Arise Australia. I just got an email from Matt Parr this morning, and he said, and he's been to probably seven or eight Arise commissionings and graduations. And he said uh, in the email he just sent this morning that this one that you were just at was mm -hmm. a, he said a 10 out of 10. And he said he was crying. He just couldn't. Yeah. He was just crying. Yeah. yeah. Jen just said an email, sent an email that said, um, this side of heaven, mm -hmm. what was it? D doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Beautiful. That was yeah. such a beautiful class. All mm -hmm. the classes are beautiful. Mm -hmm. But that inaugural class in Australia, mm -hmm. man, they were special. It was powerful. Yeah. God's Spirit was Well, there. speaking of Australia, one of the fascinating things that I've encountered there on various trips is T-shirts in stores and hats and bumper stickers that say something very fascinating. Welcome to the top of the world. Right. Because uh, they're called it. down under, oh. and we live in the northern hemisphere, they live <laughs> in the southern hemisphere, and they're basically making the point that really in the larger scheme of things in space, who's to say who's on the top <laughs> and who's on the bottom? I just said that to somebody the other day. Somebody's response to me was, they said, oh, that's obvious because the compass points to magnetic north. 
And I said, well, why couldn't we just have said, well, no, the compass points to magnetic south. Because it does. <laughs> well, but just call north-south and say that's the top, yeah. and it mm. always goes to the bottom, and yeah. then we're off to the races. It's rather mm. arbitrary, but in the, in the character and kingdom of God, it's not arbitrary. Not yeah. at all. The fact is that in God's character, the way to up is down, the top is the bottom, the bottom is the top. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. That's and right. we all sense and know what the bottom is. Yeah. We were talking about that in relation to you know, travel, and I was thinking about that in coach class bathrooms, <laughs> I, and another thought came to me, and that is... We're still in the plane. One, well, notice what it says here. In Philippians 2, one other little statement here. I'm never going to read this verse again the same. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Yeah. It's as if he's when saying I'm, right there, welcome to the top of the world. When I'm on that plane, there's one person that's in the back by the bathrooms. There's one person that's still lower than me. They don't even have a seat. They give him a jump seat. Mm. And that is the steward, the, the servant. servant. The servant. Oh, you're really impacted. The one, the one that is, yeah. the one well, that is there be, to serve. Well, you see the gospel in, in this entire I experience. saw the gospel on the plane too, actually, mm -hmm. because I'm always big on online check-in. Always make sure you got a good seat mm -hmm. before, right? But people mm -hmm. don't do that. People just show up and they get their thing, which uh, that's me. <laughs> blows my mind. I don't understand it. No, I do that too. I'm so I go through all this trouble. Well, some of us are more <laughs> oriented yeah. towards self and more <laughs> self-serving, and we want to make sure. Well, watch this amazing condescension on my behalf. Watch yes. this. We'll okay. Watch on your behalf look at his part. humility. Look at his humility. Watch go, my go, humility go. Watch humility just exude from here. So I go through all this trouble to get the, the, the proper seat, Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting down. And I'm like, oh, I'm so, I'm so thankful. Yeah. And I see people all, yeah. you know, complaining at the seat. They got the middle seat, and I'm like, mm. that's your bad, right? So then, <laughs> then the flight. Because you're a Christian, the heart of a true Christian. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> My Christianity is coming up here. In a second. <laughs> then, then the flight attendant comes and says, sir. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you, but, and then she goes onto a screen. There's a lady who has back pain, mm -hmm. who got the middle seat. Mm -hmm. She's saying, do you mind? I said, well, what other seats are available? A middle seat in the back mm. and I'm like take a deep breath Lord Jesus recite soften my heart Philippians, Philippians 2, Philippians <laughs> we're on the same page totally, totally, so, totally. so that's Jesus man so he, yes he gets up he gets up you know and and he he takes the bad seat knowing mm -hmm. yeah. that had the other mm -hmm. had we yeah. you see what I'm saying yes. yeah. had she checked in yeah. she would have avoided that it was her fault not my <laughs> fault <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. and yet you're in that situation. So I got to admit, it was it was a great joy to be mm -hmm. able to say absolutely and see her face like, mm -hmm. thank you so I'm much. I'm basking right now in the radiance of your humility. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, but correction, that was Jesus shining through me. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. Christ's God. humility love it. in you. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Hey, we were in Philippians chapter 2. You were finishing up the omnis. Yeah, Could the you omnis. do that for us? Yeah, so we were basically saying that that Jesus, in becoming human, laid aside mm -hmm. his divine prerogatives and privileges. That's the language of the Phillips translation. In the NIV, it's he made himself nothing. nothing. That's, that's amazing. And it made himself nothing, became a servant. And it goes on and it tells us that the reason he did this is so that he could suffer death. at the cross, even the death of the cross. So we went through omnipotence. And we saw in chapter 5, verse 30 of the Gospel of John that Jesus testified, of mine own self, I can do nothing. Uh, then we saw regarding omniscience or all-knowing. He grew in wisdom. Yeah, he grew yeah. in wisdom Okay, get to omnipresence. You've been over this. Omnipresence. Get to omnipresence. Omnipre calm down, calm down. Omnipresence is the hardest one biblically, in, in, mm. in my opinion. Uh, but I, I do see that there was the experience of Mary with Jesus post-resurrection. That's part of what makes it hard for me, hmm. where he says to her as she's holding him, mm. he says, detain me not, for I have do you, of course, not yet ascended to I the have Father. not yet ascended to the Father. That's, that's a space statement. That's a location statement. Mm -hmm. That's a presence statement. And Jesus is essentially saying, I'm right here with you, Mary, right now. I'm not with the Father. I haven't mm. seen the Father yet. I haven't ascended to the Father. I'm right here, right now, with you. So that's there's right. geographical restriction there, right? There's actually another one that's really, mm -hmm. really uh, blatant, I think, in John 16. 16. Yep. John 16. Where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, mm -hmm. and he's basically, he, he says something that they're just like, mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. In verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to... Your, your advantage mm -hmm. that I leave you. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine that. That must like, have sounded like crazy. what? It's like telling your wife, sweetie, I'm not going to see you again, mm -hmm. um, but trust me, it's for your own good. 
Mm. It's like, what do you mm -hmm. mean? And then it continues because if I do not go away, the helper would not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah, there's, exactly there seems, there's a message here of Jesus is acknowledging that he has become so one with humanity yeah. that there's something going on with the whole omnipresent thing. Right, right. Well, I think the point is that this renders his temptations in the wilderness and his experience at the cross, in, in fact, his whole experience as a human, be human being, it renders it authentic. Mm -hmm. It's real. He, in other words, he's not, he's not apparently going through a temptation or a struggle or a sacrifice mm. as a projection or as a charade or something that's just for us to look at and say, oh, it, it, that, it looks like he's suffering, it looks like he's tempted, but we all know, wink, nod, theologically, nah, nah, the whole time he's transcending the suffering. He's transcending the temptation. No, there, he's not transcending mm -hmm. it. He's actually experiencing it. It's real. There was an early, one of the early Christian heresies that the church had to grapple with at the end of the second, beginning of the third century was a heresy called docetism. And uh, the word basically comes from the Greek word that means to seem, mm. yeah, to, to appear. seem, to appear. And uh, I'll just read here just a quick uh, description of what docetism was. It's exactly what you're describing. This is from Wikipedia. It says, uh, the doctrine according to which the phenomenon of Christ, his historical and bodily existence, mm. and thus above all, the human form of Jesus was altogether mere semblance without any true reality. Broadly, it is taken that Jesus only seemed to be human and that his physical body was a phantasm which mm. just means a, an apparition, Phantom. A, 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 like a projection. Mm. And, and there were very good reasons for this in, in the uh, uh, early church, and that was because they were so saturated, as we are in different ways today, with Greek thinking, with Greek ideas. Mm -hmm. And one of those Greek ideas was that God was pure existence, pure being, and in that sense, fundamentally different from, cut off from, and non-integrated with, the material, the material the world. The Gnostics were into that, well, yeah. Well, yeah, docetism was part, yeah. was a kind of Gnosti yeah. Gnosticism. So the idea here is, is that, well, that couldn't have really been... God wouldn't do that. And, and not God only that he wouldn't, that. but he couldn't. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm. That it was a projection. It was... So your point is awesome here, that Scripture doesn't treat the incarnation mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. The Scripture yeah, says, yeah. no, 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 no. He was really tempted mm -hmm. in all points for the purpose of suffering so that mm -hmm. he, and I think you're exactly on, the reason for all this is not just little theological details. Mm -hmm. It's so that he could experience that which he couldn't experience if he remained aloof from us in heaven. Mm -hmm. If it were a projection, God would be the ultimate hypocrite. And if, God would yeah. be the, the ultimate actor Great. who's basically telling us a lie. Yeah, and if pretending. Jesus didn't become human, if he remained God and didn't become human, he couldn't be tempted. James says that God can't be tempted. Yeah, oh, he cannot be yeah, tempted yeah. with evil. That's right. But he was literally tempted. Can we go to yes. Matthew 4? Can Let's we do that? There. Um, Ty, I love, by the way, what you just said, absolutely love what you just said about if he was, if it was a projection and if he was pretending, then God is the ultimate hypocrite. He's the ultimate mm -hmm. hypocrite because check, and that's actually what the word hypocrite means, as you know, to acting, act. Yeah. But check this out. Even actors in a movie, when an actor is acting in a movie, whatever movie star or a guy or a girl, we all know and they know there's an agreed upon awareness mm -hmm. that's not really who they are they're pretending mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so so we give them a pass so to speak but if god was pretending all along but not letting on oh no 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 pretending like it's real but actually in other words if that's what was going on behind the curtain yeah, wizard yeah. of oz style so to speak mm -hmm. well then that's what deception. kind of a god is that anyway yeah. mm -hmm. that is outright deception and that is runs exactly against the grain and against the mm -hmm. character of what we've been learning about mm -hmm. God up to this point. Did yeah. the disciples struggle believing that it was actually him and Of course they thing? did. When he appeared, of did course he say, they like, did. didn't he say, uh, anybody got any fish? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. anybody yeah. Got any fish? I'm sorry, this is post-resurrection. Yeah, yeah, post yeah. yeah. Touch me and I'm see. Thirsty. This is flesh uh, and blood. Anybody got any food? Mm -hmm. well, this that, is the real thing. Jeffrey, yeah. it's the real thing after the resurrection. So this loops back to the point you made at the beginning of our conversation, and that is that he's retained our humanity. Yeah. Jesus didn't take our humanity into the grave and then come out of the grave in the resurrection having laid it aside. He came out of the grave as much a human being as he went into the grave mm -hmm. with a glorified body. Yes, but as much a human being as he went into the grave. And he mm -hmm. took that very humanity to the highest heavens, and he's there 
right now a member of the human race. Our brother, a member God of the human race. God is also a member of the human race. Mm. One of my favorite authors uses the language that, that heaven or that humanity is enshrined in the mm. bosom of heaven or something like bosom that. Bosom of divinity. It, yeah, is enshrined that, mm -hmm. that the picture frame around the humanity of Christ mm -hmm. is divinity. He mm -hmm. is God and you called him earlier the God man. And you use that language, that's like our own mm -hmm. invented word, but because it's, an, it's a new, novel, mm -hmm. unique reality, what else are you going to call it? He's God, he's man. Mm -hmm. He's the God man. It's mm -hmm. a mystery. So, yeah. so in Matthew 4, we have here the three temptations, and I don't know how much depth you want to go into here, but the fact that the Bible calls these temptations, I'll just read here verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, there's huge significance there, we won't get into right now, afterward he was hungry. That's a, one of the great understatements of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, then he answered, and, uh, but the, okay, so now, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. He, he says, it is written, man shall live by, um, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the second temptation, it says here that um, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, because mm -hmm. it's written that the angels will take care of you. I'm just summarizing mm -hmm. here. Verse 7, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse 8, now, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Away from me, away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God. With, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Mm -hmm. Then the devil left him. Now, here's the thing I want to bring out. I'd be very interested to see if you guys have some insights here, too. Each of these three temptations, first of all, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Mm -hmm. The very same temptation. You're pulling from 1 John there. 1 John chapter 2. Record, yeah. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now, check this out. Each temptation was a legitimate, he, Satan tapped into a legitimate desire mm -hmm. on behalf of Satan, but to access that legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. On behalf of Christ. A legitimate on desire Satan, on behalf of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Satan so, so for example. A legitimate desire on behalf of Christ. Okay, so let me just, maybe I can say it Christ more had clearly. A legitimate this. Desire. The desires were legitimate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So for example, being hungry after having not eaten for 40 days is a legitimate desire. Mm -hmm. But Satan's temptation was not to fulfill an illegitimate desire. Right but a legitimate desire in, in an illegitimate way. way. Right. The second right. temptation, <clears throat> cast yourself down from the temple. Everyone will see that you're supernatural, that you'll, they'll follow you, you'll be mm -hmm. a Messiah mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. That's appealing to a natural, legitimate desire within the heart of Jesus to be followed as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But he, he says, fulfill it in an illegitimate way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the third temptation, all the kingdoms of the earth I will give you. That was what Jesus wanted. He That's wanted. That's what he came for. Yeah. So in each Love instance, it. It's a legitimate temptation, a legitimate, tempta yeah. a legitimate temptation, wow. mm. but always to go about it in an illegitimate way. And mm -hmm. isn't that exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 3 with Eve? You just broke down three categories there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. it almost seems like in Genesis chapter 3, it tells us that Adam and Eve were tempted with the fruit on the mm, tree, and right. then they fell, and then verse 15, the promise. The promise in verse 15 is telling us that at some point in history, the Messiah would come and nail it where she failed. That's right. Mm -hmm. Be victorious where mm -hmm. she fell. So mm -hmm. three temptations. In mm. First John chapter two, you said that you were quoting from fourteen, it's, fifteen, sixteen. It's three 15, categories. 15, 16, 17. And those yeah. three categories, I'm just saying, you can see that in Genesis three. It's almost like yeah. repeat and enlarge. Yeah. History not, not, in other words, not the legitimate desire part, but the three yeah, temptation he's, he's, part. He's approaching yeah. at three different lust angles. Lust of the flesh, lust, lust of the, the eyes, eyes, pride of is life. Is there anything fascinating? Which is what she was tempted with, in other words. She was That's tempted right. with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, you'll the be desire, like God. Because it says that the fruit was the good to the eyes, wise. Right. make one you'll wise, be like pleasant God. to the eating. Right. You'll be like God. I love, before we move on here, I just love it here where Satan makes an offer to Jesus and he says, the glory of all the kingdoms, I will, all the kingdoms of the world, I will give this to you mm. if you. So this is interesting because Satan is claiming ownership yeah. of all the kingdoms of the world. So when Jesus comes into this world in, his, in, in the incarnation, he's stepping into Satan territory. Satan's territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's Enemy coming territory. to reclaim Enemy occupied Enemy territory. Enemy occupied territory. Luke's gospel renders it a little bit different and expands the idea 
um, in verse 6 of chapter 4, 4 verse 6 of the Gospel of Luke, all this authority I will give you in their glory, for this has been delivered to me. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the oh. for this has been delivered mm -hmm. to me part is referring back to the fall in Genesis right. 3. We delivered him because yeah. we were given Human dominion. beings were given the stewardship of the earth, were given the earth. You remember we, we referenced right. in a previous conversation uh, Psalm 115, the heavens, even the whole heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So Adam and Eve are the co-regents of planet earth, and by their, their fall, not only was it a moral fall, but it was a governmental fall. There was a legal yeah. element to it. Yeah, there was a legal transfer of power into the hands of the enemy, and that's why Jesus even, in yeah. chapter 12 of the Gospel of John, refers to him as the prince or the ruler of this of world. This world. Yeah. Jesus does not, and I know we have to take a break here, but I just want to say this real quickly. Jesus does not deny that the world was Satan's to give. Mm. When he says, all this mm -hmm. I will give you, he doesn't say, who do you think? Right. He, he understands and acquiesces yeah. to a basic legality yeah. mm -hmm. in the fact that you have a yeah. regency of this earth. Mm -hmm. And he's about to take it back That's right. by a different set of principles, that's by right. a different means. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what we'll be looking at In the third, when we come yeah. back after the break. Beautiful. Yeah. There are certain key truths that every person on planet Earth vitally needs to know. Truths that operate like a compass, pointing our hearts true north. To All the World is a unique magazine-style publication that highlights several of these vital truths. For your free copy, call 877-585-1111 or write to Lightbearers, 37457 Jasper Lowell Road, Jasper, Oregon, 97438. Once again, for your free copy of To All the World, call 877-585-1111 or write to Lightbearers, 37457 Jasper Lowell Road, Jasper, Oregon, 97438. Simply ask for To All the World. Okay, so where we've come from is the incarnation, and now we want to go to the cross. Okay. That's the bridge. That's the, the vital connecting link. Yeah, you're right. I love it. That, that's the vital. <laughs> that's we're, the we're vital. illustrating the cross that, here, right? How? He's giving me his ball. <laughs> See? Yes, I didn't give it to you. You took he's it. He's emptying himself. He's oh, making okay. himself nothing. But you did take it. I'm on the verge of carpal tunnel. I that's need that. True. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> here's, here's the thing. The, the incarnation prepared the way for the cross. That's, I know why that's you, what David was emphasizing in Hebrews 2 that's right. and verse 9, the right? The word that. The word that, okay? Jesus mm -hmm. became human mm -hmm. for the that of, he might taste yes. death for every human Hebrews being, 2, 9, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we've talked about the incarnation and what it entailed. Now, the cross needs to be explored in the light of the incarnation. That's, mm -hmm. that's the point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know where you guys want to go, what you're thinking about the cross, but I like to start in Matthew 26. Okay. Matthew yeah. 26. So in Matthew 26, Jesus is entering into Gethsemane with his disciples. And as he makes his way with them into this place of prayer that he's visited before, the Garden mm -hmm. of Gethsemane, in verse 36, then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. Verse 37, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now watch this language in verse 38. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, even to the point of death. Mm -hmm. Stay here and watch with me. Verse 39, and he went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This, he hasn't even reached the cross yet. And I wanna, I wanna just point out that Jesus tells the disciples right here, right now in the garden of Gethsemane, before any physical torture has been inflicted upon him, he says, I'm dying at the soul level of my being. Mm. The word soul here in the Greek is psyche. Mm. Psyche. Mm -hmm. Jesus is experiencing some kind of psychological 
agony, some kind of psychological mm. trauma that's, that's, that's inching in to death. He, he says, I'm, I'm dying right here in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's obviously not dying of physical causes. They haven't tortured mm -hmm. him yet. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been crucified yet. Jesus is experiencing something far more significant than mere physical suffering and death. Jesus is taking into himself the sin of the world in some sense that we could never fully comprehend. The weight of the sins of the world is beginning to crush the life out of him. That's right. It's, do you think it's almost as if, I don't know how far to take that, but it's almost as if the cross is inconsequential. Even if the cross had an approach, at some point, Christ would have Man, died. that's a huge thought. Christ, the, the know, weight would have crushed him. The, the fact that the cross was on his path. Jeffrey, that, to that triggers way. a thought. I think that there's biblical evidence for that. And it's in Luke's gospel where while Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane. he was so heavy. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. And he's sweating. Luke's gospel adds he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. Yeah. And then an angel of God appeared strengthening him. I'm yeah. literally parked right there. Are you? The, yeah, the implication is okay. that Jesus would have died in Gethsemane and never reached the cross if the angel had not intervened to strengthen him. That's right. Mm. The very That's point heavy. that you're making, yeah, it's there. That's heavy. Mm -hmm. so, so the mission was so intense that Jesus had to invoke, so to speak, help in yeah. order to lift him up as he was, he was learning. I love the language here, being in agony. Not physical agony, mm -hmm. right? It's got to be beyond fit. If it was well, just Well, I physical, think we can't say, uh, go ahead. You go ahead and then I'll say what I'm saying. Well, I was just going to say, if it was merely physical, then somebody pointed out, there's been generals, army generals in a, that have died for their people or died in torturous in ways. Torturous yeah. ways. And let's be, let's be honest, Christ was tortured, no doubt. But surely we can conceive of other physical tortures throughout history that would have been equal to or even more horrific. Mm. Certainly. Right? Yeah. So the, the, the awe here is not merely in the physical. It has to go beyond the physical. That's right. You got my point. I think beyond is good and not merely. Yeah. That, that would be the, the accurate yeah. language. He did suffer physically, no doubt about it. But what's happening in Gethsemane is described by Jesus himself in John chapter 3. I'll just throw these out. And by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21. In John 3, Jesus likened himself and his upcoming sacrifice at the cross to the serpent being lifted up on the pole in the wilderness. The serpent throughout scripture, as we've talked about in a previous conversation, is associated with sin and evil and the devil, in That's fact, right? right? So Jesus, Jesus, we always think of him in terms of he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that's an accurate symbol as well. But here Jesus in John 3 identifies with the serpent. Oh, man. He identifies with, with, with the emblem of evil itself. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says, tells us exactly what's happening here. Yeah. He says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So sin He's, he's, he's taking upon himself, into himself, sin, shame, guilt. He's experiencing, what does Isaiah 53 say? Mm -hmm. Numbered with the transgressors, mm -hmm. as if he himself is guilty of sin. You know, Ty, that text in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, I, was, I began to read this a bit differently, just trying to put myself in the text. In, in every place where it says he or him to insert who is referring to, mm -hmm. and when it talks about sin, to just pick a sin, just pick any sin. Let me just explain what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. For the Father, now I'm inserting, mm -hmm. for the Father made... Just, just re re repeat the verse, and I know you said it once. Just 2 Corinthians 5.21. For the Father made the Son, who knew no lies, mm -hmm. to be a liar for Jeffrey, mm. so that Jeffrey might become the righteousness of God in the Son. So in, in every way, you were just saying that uh, he became identified. Mm. He's the serpent. He's not just the lamb. He's also the serpent. But this, the, the serpent was the symbol of evil and sin. Of evil and sin. So Jesus becomes identified with that. Although he's perfectly innocent on mm. our behalf. Yeah. And so I always picture like DVDs in heaven, like there's a big old library of DVDs that represent each and every one of our lives. And 
the gospel message is that when God presses play in the DVD and Jeffrey's story plays, in every juncture where there's sin in mm -hmm. my life, he presses pause, he, I'm out of the frame, and Jesus is in the frame. Wow. Mm. And he presses unpause, mm. and the movie plays on. And mm. Jesus now begins to take my place in every single point in my life. Mm. And I think that's what that text is communicating. Mm -hmm. He has mm -hmm. become sin for, for the human race. He, uh, he was not himself a sinner, but he was treated as a sinner. Yes. He had the experience of a sinner. In fact, I mean, you're there, so I'm just going to quickly grab that. If we go back to the covenantal faithfulness theme that we've That's been carrying exactly through here. Okay, so you go, go you there. Got it. No, you got, it. you got it, you got it, you got it, go. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him, for the Father has made the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness, the righteousness of, God, of God, which is God's covenantal right. faithfulness in the Messiah's faithfulness of the covenant. And the mm -hmm. truth of the cross wow. is that he was faithful unto death. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's this great line where C.S. Lewis speaks about when a temptation comes to us, we often don't feel the full force of the mm -hmm. temptation because mm -hmm. we give into it. Yes. So, you know, let's say the temptation is 10 units. Mm -hmm. We often fall at two or three or four or five. But, but Jesus, and there are sometimes we overcome temptation, mm -hmm. praise God, but every temptation that mm -hmm. came to Jesus, 10 out of 10, he exhausted it. So the temptation... So he took it to the most intense level. To the most, in, he exhausted the temptation. The temptation never exhausted him. Mm. He was faithful unto death. The, the temptation to, to cut himself off from humanity, the temptation mm. to just yeah. whisk, him, whisk yeah. his way back to heaven was overwhelming. And the temptations just kept throwing themselves at Christ. Wow, wow, wow. And he just exhausted each one. It came to him and they fell like toy soldiers. Because yeah. if there's a meter mm -hmm. that yeah. the devil... Yeah, yeah. He pumps yeah. up the volume, but he That's only right. has to pump it up some, and then I fall. In well, a of sense, course it's he's like pumping up the marathon. volume. Very much so. Because, because that first 10 miles, even the first 15 miles, mm -hmm. it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> but when you get to those final miles, yeah, 20 then to you begin to experience the physical exertion to the point of, of an intensity that you want to succumb to. The human body yeah. just wants to shut down. We've run like five miles or 10 miles and we, and we stop. We yield to the temptation. Jesus ran mm -hmm. the gamut of sin straight through mm -hmm. to the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Sure, because we always say he was tempted in every form that, we were for, that, that we've been tempted in. But then you think, well, he was, was Jesus ever a teenager in Miami? Was Jesus ever a single mom in, in the right. Bronx? Mm. You know, what do you mean he was tempted in every single form? But I think that's the point, is that in every possible category, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the devil the volume, pumped up the yeah, body yeah, yeah. all the way up, mm -hmm. and it encompasses every possible Lust of the flesh, yeah. lust yeah. of the eyes, pride. and the pride but of life. But there's more than temptation, although that's, that's huge. There's, there's, there's something going on at the cross, and in Gethsemane at the cross, that Isaiah 53 outlines, that is just phenomenal, that you're, that you're talking about, Jeffrey. In chapter 53 of Isaiah, verse 6, Notice the language here. It's a, it's a messianic prophecy pointing forward to Jesus. It says, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, that's God the Father, has laid on him, that's Jesus the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. So here, the, the sin problem in total is put upon Jesus. Mm. He's bearing it, but here's the thing. He's not bearing it has a mere physical weight upon his body. It's not like a sack of rocks or potatoes. It's not, it's not pressing mm -hmm. on his shoulders. It's pressing on his mind because the prophecy goes on. If you just skip down to verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He mm -hmm. shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days mm -hmm. and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Look at verse 11. He shall see, that is, God the Father shall see the labor of his soul, mm -hmm. the labor of the Messiah's soul under the weight of sin. Right. And then that labor is described in the latter part of verse 11 by saying he shall bear their iniquities mm -hmm. in his soul. And then the final one, verse 12, it says, middle of verse 12, because he poured out his soul mm -hmm. unto death, Later on, he bore the sin of the many and made intercession for transgressors. Mm -hmm. Repeatedly, you have the language of, of bearing, carrying mm -hmm. sin, its weight. 
And we know from personal experience, at least in a microcosm sense, what it means to bear the shame and weight of sin, but we have never carried or borne the weight of our sin in totality. No. We felt guilty, we felt shame, but we have never actually mm -hmm. borne the full psychological ramifications of our guilt. Yeah, look at these verses again in Isaiah 53, verses three and four, because they set us up for this. It says in verse three, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, where does that take place? In the mind. Acquainted with grief, where does that take place? In the mind. We hid our faces from him. He was despised. We didn't esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stri stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Where is all that happening? Mm -hmm. Not just the griefs and the sorrows, but the way that we relate to him. The way that we esteem him there, there's, or disesteem it's, him. It's in the mind. The thing I want to say about this is Paul in Galatians 3 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Mm -hmm. He's quoting from Deuteronomy mm -hmm. here. We've talked a lot about covenant, and we don't have time to develop this because we're coming to the end of the conversation, but this will be something for our listeners to, to think about, to tune into, and for us as well. Jesus not only kept the covenant between God and man, According to the, the covenant curses of Deuteronomy 28 and 29, Jesus bore those covenant curses mm -hmm. in himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he is both the positive aspect of the covenant. He loved the Lord as God with all his heart, mind, and soul, and his neighbor like himself. Mm -hmm. But then he bears the covenant curses and hangs mm -hmm. on the cross, mm -hmm. forsaken, forlorn, and tempted in both physical and especially mental and psychological ways mm -hmm. and and he exhausts the temptation his last words are father forgive them they don't know what they do yeah. and you know, he I, dies i can really relate to this in a personal way because when i was a kid i have a twin sister and every once in a while we would get into arguments and fight and physically i was stronger than her and i've always known that things don't hurt me as well physically mm. she could hit me and she could hurt me, and it really didn't hurt. But what really hurt me was the fact that she did it. Yeah. It was it was the fact that something? she did it. Even yeah. in, in any situation, yeah. physically it wasn't that physical. That's pain. not the point. It was the mental. Yeah. It was the fact that someone could do that. Someone could inflict that pain. That's where yeah. I broke down. That's where I felt the pain. Yeah. And I think that when you look at the cross and you look at all the physical pain, that is allowed in order to give us an indication mm. yeah, there of you the go. mental suffering that Christ is going Jeffrey through. Jeffrey said something earlier that when you first said it, I'll be honest, Jeffrey, I cringed just a little bit. I was like, I, I drew back from it, but then I embraced it. You said, in a sense, the cross is almost inconsequential. Mm. The, the, the actual physical torturous suffering that's not the point. Mm -hmm. It could have been mm -hmm. in a field. It could have been at a guillotine. Mm -hmm. It could have been at some other way. It wasn't that, but the external physical death mm -hmm. is just the surface. And I think you're mm -hmm. right. That's just a window yes. yeah. into what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was the worst torture that could be, was created by man in that time. The bottom line of this beautiful truth is that God literally loves every human being mm -hmm. more than his own life. That's right. Jesus became human Hallelujah. and he experienced all the ramifications mm -hmm. of our sin and guilt. He took it to the cross. He died on our behalf, not because his back was against a wall or he had to, but because he literally loves us more than himself. Mm. And that is the ultimate fulfillment mm. of the covenant promise. Mm -hmm. God is faithful in Christ. Yes. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. To purchase the complete Table Talk 13-part Big Picture series, visit us online at lightbearers.org or call us toll-free at 877-585-1111. Once again, to purchase this Table Talk series, call 877-585-1111.